Hello, and welcome to the Intrepid Museum's virtual programming. Thank you for joining us. Um, we look forward to hearing your questions throughout this program, and we're gonna try and address as many of those as we can, just make sure to put them in the comments. Um, the museum's live streams are free, so if you would like to support us in delivering more of this exciting content, um, please click on the link in the description below. My name is Jen and I'm an educator at the Intrepid Museum. And today I'm gonna to be talking you guys through and walking you guys virtually through some of Intrepid's highlights. Um, we are going to be looking at some of my absolute favorite things that we have at the museum. Um, but before we do that, we're gonna get started with a little bit of an overview of Intrepid itself. So here we go. All right, so this, what you are looking at right now, this is the Intrepid. Um, and this is um, how it looks both today as a museum and while it was in service with the Navy. Uh, one of the most fascinating things about the Intrepid is that um, it had a whole life before um, it became a museum. Um, it had a whole life in service with the Navy. It was built um, and used primarily during World War II. And you can see a photo of that, um, the black and white photo over here on the left. Um, it was an Essex-class aircraft carrier uh, built um, from 1941 to 1943. Um, and they actually began construction on this ship um, on December 1st, 1941, a mere six days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, where we're located today, um, we are, let me show you a photo of that. We are over on the Hudson River. So we are quite literally not in a building. Um, we are still on the ship and we are floating in the river. I want you guys to take a moment and I want you to see if you can find Intrepid in this image. Kind of like a where's Waldo, where's Intrepid. Um, all right, I'm going to show you where the ship is in three, two, one, and there it is. So Intrepid is located on the Hudson River. We are docked at Pier 86, um, all the way at the end of West 46th Street. So you go to Times Square, go to 46th Street, turn west and dead end at the Hudson River and you cannot miss us. Um, so you can see us located right there, Manhattan over to the right, and then a little snippet of New Jersey over to the left. Um, a little bit about Intrepid's history. Um, I mentioned earlier Intrepid was an Essex-class aircraft carrier. It was in service with the Navy for 31 years from 1943 to 1974. And during that time, it was involved in World War II, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, and also as a NASA recovery vessel during the space race. Um, Intrepid has been a museum since 1982. Um, we are now at a point where we have been a museum for just a little bit longer than the ship was in service with the Navy. And we hope to continue to be a museum and uh, share the rich history of Intrepid for a long time. All right, so that's a bit of an overview of the ship itself. And now I'm gonna show you guys, let's go ahead and let's start with an aircraft from World War II. What you are looking at right here in this image, uh, this is the TBM Avenger. This is the oldest aircraft that we have in our collection. This is the only aircraft that we have from World War II. Um, one fun fact about the Avenger is that one of our former presidents actually flew in an Avenger during World War II. So I want you guys to guess, and feel free, if you know this, go ahead and put it in the comment, um, but which president flew in an Avenger in World War II? Does anyone out there know? Any guesses? I'll give you a hint. If you're really good with the presidential numbers, it would be our 41st president. The 41st president was the one who flew on Intrepid. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna show you guys. Here he is in all of his glory in World War II. That is our 41st president, um, George H.W. Bush, and he flew in an Avenger. Um, and so there he is, how he looked back then. He looked like a, a pretty skilled pilot, if you ask me. Um, and so let's take a moment, and I want you guys to focus on the image of the Avenger here. And what are some of the things that you guys notice about the Avenger? Um, to me, it looks a little bit different than other planes you might find um, at an airport or in the sky. Um, 
So take a moment and either put in the comments what are some things you notice or what um, maybe share with a friend. <laughs> All right. One of the first things that I noticed when I started working on Intrepid is that Avenger doesn't look like it has any wings. It definitely does not look like the wings are there. Um, and, and I'll have a lot of students who ask me when I'm taking them around the museum, they immediately ask me, are the wings broken? They look like they're broken, um, but they aren't. Um, we're gonna take a closer look at what's going on. And you can see right here, um that uh the wings are folded if you look up close where the wings are supposed to be you can see that there's a mechanism um to allow these wings to fold back um and you can actually see in my photo here on the left that mechanism up close and then looking here on the right we have a full view of that wing and i actually have a, a smaller avenger so i want to give you let me show you what the Avenger looks like. I'm going to back up because this model, I can't even fit it. Um, but you look right here at my model, which, again, is so big that I can't even fit it in my whole like screen right now. Um, it's so large. Um, but you can get a sense of just how big these wings are when they are full, when they are open so that this craft can fly. Um, this model Avenger, these wings are going to make up about two thirds of the body of the entire plane. And that's that's huge. So why would Intrepid have you know Avengers? Why would it have planes so that made so that you can fold them? Um, we're going to take a look at why these wings needed to fold um, in the next photo that I have. Um, and you can see here um, these wings really needed to fold in order to make it easier for these planes to move around the Intrepid. Um, so you can see in my photo here on the left, we have an image of the flight deck of Intrepid in World War II, and we have several different types of aircraft. Some of them have wings that fold back, just like the Avengers. Some of them have wings that fold up. Um, but you're going to need that to allow these planes to move around. Um, during World War II, Intrepid would have anywhere between 50 and 100 aircraft on it. And all of those planes would have had large wingspans. The Avenger, for instance, has a wingspan of 54 feet. Um, and when you have a 54 foot wingspan, moving around and turning is really, really difficult when your wings are out. You can actually see an image of two Avengers flying here on the right. And you can see just how big that wingspan is. Um, the wingspans for the planes in World War II would have been larger than later on in Intrepid's career. And that's simply because um, all the planes in World War II were driven by jet, are driven by propeller engines. I'm sorry, I'm mixing myself up. They're driven by propeller engines. Um, propellers uh, engines are not as powerful as the jet engines that we see today. Um, so in order to get an aircraft like the Avenger up up into the air, um, it's going to need a certain amount of power pulling it forward so that we can get air moving around the wings. But because propeller engines aren't as powerful as jet engines, um, the plane's kind of made up for it by having a larger wingspan so that you have a greater surface area on the wing to allow for air to move around it so that lift is generated and then we get the plane up into the air. So um, even though the Avenger has, you know, a bit of a, a weaker engine than the jets that we have flying around today, it still has that large wingspan to get it flying. And the Avenger, it's not going to go very fast, even with that large wingspan. Um, it is only going to reach a speed of about 276 miles per hour or 444 um, kilometers per hour. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was nicknamed the turkey because it was a little bit bulkier, a little bit awkward as it was flying. Okay. Um, so let's go back and let's take a look at some other things that we might notice about the Avenger. And here's a different view of it, um, kind of get that better view of that folded wing mechanism. And you can see right on the front of the craft, uh, we have that propeller that's going to help get the Avenger up to that 276 miles per hour. Um, what are some other things that you guys notice about Avenger? Does anyone notice anything else? Well, the other big thing that I notice about the Avenger is that torpedo that's coming right out of the belly. Um, the Avenger was a torpedo bomber, so it was equipped to carry either one 2,000 pound torpedo or two 1,000 pound missiles. And so you can see in the image here, there's that torpedo. 
Um, and so there's a lot of things going on when this Avenger is up in the air, right? You have to make sure that it is flying. You have to make sure that that torpedo is being dropped when it needs to be dropped. And you also have to make sure as you know, you're know you flying and you're targeting something with a torpedo, you have to make sure that this plane is not getting shot down by enemy planes or by other enemy aircraft. So you actually would have had three people inside the Avenger during World War II. And let me bring my model back and show you guys. So right here, I'm gonna show you the side of my model. Um, so here's the front of it. My model does not have a propeller on it, but you can clearly see the side. And this is where we're going to have our crew inside this Avenger. So the first of the three people that we have flying in this plane is you have your pilot. And the pilot's gonna be right up here in the front um, he is in the cockpit. His main job in this entire you know, ordeal is to drive this plane. He's just making sure it is getting to where it needs to go. He is also going to be the one that ultimately drops the torpedo, um, but first and foremost, flying this plane. The second gentleman you have flying in here, he's actually going to be in the back right here in this little kind of round spot to the rear of the cockpit. Um, he's a gunner and he's going to be flying in a gun turret. And let me actually show you a picture of that in my presentation. You can see that now on my screen. Um, but the gun turret is going to be facing the rear of the aircraft, so towards the tail, so he's not ever gonna face the pilot and accidentally shoot the pilot. Um, and so he's going to be defending this plane. He's going to make sure that any enemy aircraft that come by, um, he's going to try and take care of them. The third gentleman that you have flying in this plane, and I'll bring my model up here, it's so big, is actually down here. He's a radio man. And he is going to be on headset. He's in communication with people on Intrepid. And he's going to be giving directions to the pilot and to the gunner. And he's essentially a human GPS. And so these are the three gentlemen that you have flying in this aircraft. And you can see, here's a, let me bring up a little larger here. You can see the close up of the ball turret that we have at the ship. And then a lovely image of um, from World War II of the Avenger dropping that torpedo. And so um, that is a little bit about the Avenger, kind of our first stop on this virtual tour. Does anybody have any questions? Are there any questions in the comment? Anyone? <laughs> does not sound like it, and that's absolutely fine. And like I said, if you guys have any questions later on, feel free to put those in the comments below, and I'm happy to answer them. Okay, so we're gonna move a little bit forward in time um, from World War II, and we are actually gonna focus on a very different type of aircraft from um, the Cold War era. This aircraft did not actually fly off of Intrepid, um, but it is fascinating, and we are very fortunate to have it in our collection, and that is the A-12, the Lockheed A-12. And so, here we have a beautiful photo of the Lockheed A-12 on our flight deck at the Intrepid Museum. And um, it, the, one of the fun facts about this aircraft is that this is one of the fastest planes in the entire world. Not just the entire world, ever in existence. Um, this is, if not the fastest, one of the, one of, one of the fastest planes. Um, and so I want you guys to take a look at it, just kind of examine it, take a moment. And what are some of the things that you notice uh, that help it possibly go as fast as it does? What are some things that you notice that help it go as fast as it does? All right, put those comments in the chat or maybe turn and talk to a friend. And I'm gonna show you guys some of those design elements that help it go as fast as it does. Um, so a couple of things. One is this has this craft has larger jet engines than any that I've ever seen, probably the largest in the world. And so you can see right here, we have an up close image of one of the jet intakes. And you can see my image on the left um, has the front of the jet intake with the red ring around it. That ring would actually come off of the craft prior to the A-12 taking off. Um, and it's going to pull air in 
um, as you know, as it's flying. And then my image here on the right, you can see the exhaust for that uh, jet intake. And so everything, all the exhaust is going to come out of that at the back of the plane, and it's going to propel this entire craft forward. And when I say that it helps propel this entire craft forward and gets it going as fast as it does, I'm talking about supersonic speeds, all right? The A-12 can reach Mach three, which is three times the speed of sound. And for those of you that don't have the speed of sound like tucked away in your brain, um, Mach three equals about 2,300 miles per hour or right around 3,700 kilometers per hour. Um, that's really, really incredibly fast. Um, so um, you're gonna need an extremely large jet engine to pull that off, and that's what we have here. But more than just the jet engine, um, we have on the A12, you guys see there's a pointed nose, there's a pointed cone on the front of that intake. Um, and that pointed cone actually helps make this entire craft go faster. What it does is it cuts through the air and it kind of redirects the air and helps reduce drag. And drag, sometimes known as air resistance, that's the force that's gonna try and slow this aircraft down as it's flying. So having an element that just simply cuts through the air and helps reduce drag is already going to make that go, this craft go faster. Um, adding on to the work that the jet engine is doing. Uh, in addition to the point on the jet intake, if we go to the front of the aircraft, uh, we also have a pointed nose cone. And you can see that here in my image at the top left. Um, that's an up close shot of that pointed nose. Um, and this is quite literally gonna do the same job that the point on the jet intake is gonna do. It is going to cut through the air. It is going to try and reduce drag um, as a way of helping this aircraft go faster. And then looking at um, the other images that I have here, um, you know, the one on the bottom, you get a good look at the length of the entire A-12. And you can see that the design of the craft, the design of the fuselage, it's just very sleek, um, it's not going to be round and cylindrical and clunky like the Avenger was. Um, everything about this craft is designed in such a way to help it go faster, to help it redirect the air, to help it be more aerodynamic so that it's cutting through the air, it's reducing drag, and it's reaching that Mach 3 level speed, okay? Um, some other things that you might notice about the A-12, if you're looking around, is that there are no weapons on it. We don't have a torpedo coming out of the belly like we did with the Avenger. Um, there are no guns, there are no missiles, um, there's nothing. And that's because this craft was not used for combat. Um, the A-12s were used by the CIA. And uh, the CIA means that this was a spy plane. Um, so this wasn't really going to be used to engage with other um other planes in the air, um, it was really used to spy on other people. And and not even using it to spy, uh, but it also was uh, going faster and higher than anything in the air at the time, right? Oh, and I see a question, is the nose point also, uh, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing this wrong, a pedo tube? You know what? That's a great question. Um, that is one that I actually, off the top of my head, don't know. But we are going to get back to you really quickly. Um, we're going to try and get that answer for you before our program is done. Okay. Um, so I mentioned that this aircraft, in addition to going as fast as it does, it's going faster than anything that's flying at the time that this is flying. It is also going higher than anything at the time. Um, that is flying at the same time as this. Um, the A-12 can reach an altitude of around 80,000 feet um, or 20, 24,300 meters. Um, sorry, just checking my notes there. Um, but this is going really high. Uh, this is going so high that the pilot who is flying in it needs to wear a pressurized spacesuit. And I'm gonna show you a picture of a pilot so right here, we actually have an image of Robert Gilliland. 
Um, he was not a pilot of the A-12. He was a test pilot for the SR-71s. Um, he was a primary test pilot for the SR-71s. Um, the A-12s um, and the SR-71s were both designed by Lockheed. Um, the SR-71s were designed a little bit later, um, but they could go the same altitude, the same speed as the A-12s, and they were used largely by the Air Force. Um, and because they're going the same altitude, the same speed, um, pilots of the A-12 would have been wearing a pressurized suit similar to Robert Gilliland that you can see here in this photo. And the reason they need that pressurized space, or pressurized, I keep saying space suit because it looks like a space suit. But the reason that they need that pressurized suit is because 80,000 feet, that's incredibly high. And 80,000 feet above the Earth's surface, that is above a region where you would find what we call the Armstrong limit. Um, the Armstrong limit is in a zone above the Earth's surface that's right around 59,000 to 62,000 feet. And in that range, depending on what kind of protection a person is wearing, um, if they're wearing no protection whatsoever, that is the range where water begins to boil at body temperature. And that's a really terrifying thing. Um, you think about how much of the human body is water. And if all of that water were just to start boiling at body temperature, bad things would happen. Um, so pilots who are you know, going above 59,000 feet above the Earth's surface, which is definitely below what the A-12s could do, um, they are going to need to wear special protection. And they're going to need to wear pressurized suits in order to keep them safe. And that's something that engineers and scientists have to learn as they're developing these um, these new aircraft. You know, as we continue to develop um, technology in the field of aviation, these are the kinds of things that we have to test because we're not just going to send someone up at a certain altitude um, without knowing if it's safe for them to be there. Um, in fact, speaking of testing, my image here on the right, um, I don't know if you can quite read uh, the label that's on the tail of that craft. That is an SR-71, um, but that is an SR-71 that is being utilized by NASA. In the 1990s, NASA borrowed three SR-71s from the Air Force in order to run tests, run high-speed, high-altitude tests so that they could continue to do research in aeronautics. And again, just making it safe for people to go up into the sky. And I love that we're kind of closing out our little A-12 talk with NASA because that segues perfectly into the final object that I am going to show you guys today. Um, it is my favorite object at the Intrepid Museum. Um, I, I was so excited when I started working there because this is one of my favorite things, and that is the Space Shuttle Enterprise. But before I show you the Space Shuttle Enterprise, let me backtrack a little bit. Let's talk about Intrepid in the space race, okay? I mentioned earlier that Intrepid had a connection to NASA and had a connection to the space race. Um, does anybody have a guess what that connection to the space race is? And feel free to put that in the comments. Or, you know, if you don't want to, if you don't want to put it in the comments, but you have someone next to you, feel free to turn and talk and share that guess. All right. I'm going to tell you in about three, two, one. Um, Intrepid served as a recovery vessel for some of the early space missions during the space race. So here you can see an image of the first astronaut that we picked up. Um, and that is astronaut Scott Carpenter. And you can see him on the right in the photo um, where he is on the flight deck of Intrepid. And you can see the launch of his Mercury spacecraft here on the left. Um, and in 1962, Scott Carpenter went up in his Mercury spacecraft and splashed down and he was recovered from the ocean by Intrepid. And so we had him on Intrepid and that was our first 
kind of touch with the space race and our first connection with the space race. And then three years later in 1965, Intrepid did it again. And so here you can see on the left, a picture of Intrepid picking up the Gemini 3 space capsule, recovering it from the water. Um, Gemini 3 carried astronauts, John Young and Gus Grissom. And uh, it's not every day you have astronauts on board Intrepid. So when they did, they would of course celebrate. And you can see in the black and white photo on the right, here we have Gus Grissom in the front and John Young towards the back. And they are cutting that celebratory cake um, and so Intrepid had a very large crew, over 3,000 men. Um, so for a very large crew, you need a very large cake. And when you have a very large cake, um, you use swords to cut the cake. So here you can see John and Gus um, cutting the cake with their swords and celebrating a successful Gemini 3 mission. And that is why Intrepid is fortunate and is Intrepid is fortunate enough to have Space Shuttle Enterprise. And here's Enterprise in all its glory in our Space Shuttle Pavilion um, on the flight deck of Intrepid. And I'm not even gonna lie or sugarcoat it. This is my favorite thing that we have at the museum. I absolutely love this. Um, now, I, I do have one tiny little secret about Enterprise. And if you already know this tiny little secret about Enterprise, or you think you know it, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, but my tiny little secret about Enterprise is Enterprise never actually went into space. It's kind of a bummer, but Enterprise is still a real space shuttle. It is still awesome, and I'm still gonna tell you all about it right now. Um, I mentioned Enterprise was the first of the space shuttles. Um, prior to Enterprise, NASA was using capsules. So Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, all of those were capsule programs. So here you have Enterprise, it's a very different type of spacecraft. And um, Enterprise being the first one, uh, NASA's not gonna send it right up to space. Instead, Enterprise was used as a prototype orbiter. Um, and so my question for you, what is a prototype, all right? Why do you guys, what is a prototype? What do we do with a prototype? Feel free to put that in the chat, all right? Or turn and talk to a friend if you have a friend right next to you. Um, a prototype is like a test model. Um, so instead of sending Enterprise up into space, NASA ran a series of tests on it. All right, and they ran these tests on it for several reasons, okay? Um, we had to test Enterprise to make sure that it did exactly what we wanted it to do, all right? It did its job. Uh, they needed to make sure that it was the best it could be, you know, check and see, are there any areas for improvement? And also, the really, really big one, NASA needed to make sure that this craft was safe, okay? NASA's not gonna send an astronaut to space if it's not safe for them to go and come back. Um, so Enterprise went through a whole slew of tests, okay? Um, it needed They needed to make sure that this craft was structurally sound when we put everything that we needed to put inside of it. Uh, they needed to make sure that when we stand an orbiter up vertically and we attach it to three rockets, you know, two solid rocket boosters and an external fuel tank, and when we launch those rockets, the vibration from those rockets, we need to make sure that that vibration is not going to shake the shuttle to pieces, shake the orbiter to pieces. And then we also need to test the landing. So the three prior, you know, main space programs, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, those are all gonna come back down to Earth and they're gonna splash down in the ocean. Enterprise is not going to do that. Instead, Enterprise is designed to land on a runway. And that's why Enterprise went through um, probably the most famous of its tests was the approach and landing tests. And what that means is we need to check and see that this craft can get down on a runway and land safely. And you might think, you know, we've been flying airplanes for well before we've had space shuttles. So how do we not know how to do that? Um, well, we don't, we do know how to do that, but Enterprise is not an aircraft. It does not have a jet engine. 
It does not have a propeller engine on it. It relies on rocket technology in order to launch. So when it's coming back down to Earth, for all intents and purposes, it's just a really big glider. And NASA needed to make sure that a pilot could control that really big glider and get it down to a runway safely. So here you are looking at a picture um, on the left, um, an image from uh, approach and landing test number four. Five of these approach and landing tests were done um, in total. And what they did to test the uh, to test Enterprise during the approach and landing tests is they quite simply put it on the back of a modified 747 that we call the shuttle carrier aircraft. And then they kind of lifted it up to a certain altitude and then they just let it go and they let it glide back down to that runway. So approach and landing test number four was piloted by Richard Truly and Joe Engel. And you can see them here in this photo on the right, um, kind of getting out of Enterprise after that test is complete. And then approach and landing test number five, right here, was piloted by Fred Hayes and Gordon Fullerton. And you can see them here in the cockpit in my image on the right um, before for the approach and landing test number five. And over here on the left, here's the final approach and landing test. And here you can see Enterprise about to safely land on that runway at Edwards Air Force Base. So Enterprise didn't go to space, but arguably, you know, I think a case can be made for it being one of the most important shuttles in existence. Because without Enterprise passing these tests, um, we wouldn't have had a shuttle program. And you think about, take a moment and think about what that means. All of the things that happen, um, all the things that happen with uh, Enterprise and with the shuttle program, I mean, um, the Hubble Space Telescope would not have gone to space without the shuttle program. All of the pieces for ISS went up to space in the shuttle program. We would not have had a, uh, a shuttle program if we didn't have Enterprise and we wouldn't have ISS without the shuttle program. So arguably, I think that um, I think that Enterprise is one of the uh, one of the most important shuttles in existence. And so that, friends, um, those are my three things. And um, I know that we kind of went a little bit fast today. Um, I kind of whirled you through the Avenger and the A-12 and Space Shuttle Enterprise. Are there any questions out there um, about anything? I would love to answer any questions that you guys might have. How many people can fit into a space shuttle? Um, that varies. Um, so they were designed, I believe, to fit around 10 or 11. Um, typically on space shuttle missions, you would have had seven or eight. The final space shuttle mission had a crew of four. So really anywhere in the range of, you know, about four to eight or so is what actually went up on the space shuttles. Um, and so that's about how many people. Um, any other questions out there? Give it a moment. I rushed through several things. <laughs> All right, friends. Well, if there are no questions out there, um, then, oh, there is one. Is the A12 the same as the Blackbird? That's a great question. Um, and the answer is no, an A12 is not the same as the Blackbird. Um, the A12 and the Blackbird, the SR-71 Blackbird, they were both designed by Lockheed. The A12 came first. So the A12 was the predecessor to the SR-71 Blackbird. Um, for the most part, they're largely similar. Um, the speeds, the top speeds for both aircraft are going to be about the same. The maximum altitude for both aircraft are going to be about the same. The two big differences between the A-12 and the SR-71 Blackbird is that the A-12s were used by the CIA and the SR-71 Blackbird was used by the military. And then the only other big difference is that the A-12 carries one person and the SR-71 carries two people. So um, the pilot has a buddy in the SR-71. And uh, that's about it. Those are the big differences. So great question. All right, friends. 
Well, if there are no other questions out there, I just want to thank you guys for joining us today, for your questions, for your comments. Um, the museum, they've introduced a number of new live streams. So please follow um, or subscribe th to this channel or visit the website if you are interested in seeing more. At our website, you can find the latest streaming schedule. And links to all of that to the website um, are in the description below. So like I said, thank you guys for joining me. And uh, I hope you guys have a great day.